Good, I'm good. So um, this subject, after about five hours and I don't know, 80 slides, I was just like, stop. So I'm just going to kind of go over the top of it and then just throw questions at me and I'll do my best to answer. And I know there's some other fellow EV owners here and they can also pass on the their experiences. But before we get into all that wonderful things, I need my glasses. Anyways, uh, I would like to begin by acknowledging that we are on Treaty 4 land, referred to as Treaty 4 territory, and that the city of Estevan and all the people here and beneficiaries of this treaty, Treaty 4, encompasses the lands of the Cree, Sotu, Dakota, Nakota, Lakota, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. We respect and honor the treaties that were made on all territories. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past, and we are committed to move forward in partnership and Indigenous nations in the spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. All right, so rules for tonight. <laughs> I think this is just, I didn't make this today. It's in its existing slide, but um, you know, disagree, discuss, totally. That's how we make the world a better place. There is no one answer for anything. Um, just be respectful. I love this one, soapbox are for soap. Um, and also just, um, if you have a statement, just make it quick so that other people have an opportunity to talk. That'll be great. So who am I? I hold, despite all uh, rumors, I have never been a part, uh, member of any political party because I've run a for-profit multinational software company and the politicians always get in my way. So. I'm not interested in any of that. Uh, I am, believe it or not, currently enrolled in MIT. I'm taking innovation and technology, thanks to Dr. Eric Grimson's visit here. He reminded me of something I wanted to do when I was at 19, and he said, yeah, let's do it. So that's what I did. And if anyone else, give it a try. It's not as hard as you think. Uh, and I don't own any shares in any supply chain or manufacturing, though I wish I should, but I think shares-wise, it's too, Fickle right now, who would you buy shares in? But I am an EV owner since uh, 2020, and my wife bought uh, an EV last year, and we do also have one gas car, because I'm not an ideological driven person type of thing. Because I also love gas cars. If you're aware, I've been for free the last two years filming and promoting our dirt track racing. And there is absolutely nothing more thrilling to stand in the middle of that track and feel the vibrations of those cars going around you and the noise and the smell. It is so exciting. And uh, this is one thing I hope never goes electric because it gets a, that experience that you get from that vibration. My son and I, we've watched F1 for <clears throat> 20 years or yeah, 20 years now. And my ex-wife, uh, was from London, so every time or England, so we'd always go to England. Uh, and when we were there, the biggest th thing we would do is we'd go to the McLaren store, and you could always hear it before you got there, just by the noise. It was awesome. Uh, my my dream car is actually a McLaren P1. And yes, Josh, if you're watching this, I want to drive your car. I can't believe there's one here. No, that's not a P1 though. I think. Anyways, so who's the Southeast Tech Hub? We are essentially an incubator, an accelerator. Uh, it's a place where uh, startups, if you have a wonderful idea, you want to start up a business, uh, you come here, it's technology based, but there's also economic development side. So uh, even though I apparently work for Trudeau, I am for coal. So I, for the last year, have been working on a project, which we'll get into more de detail on March the 6th, where I've helped raise private equity of 10 sorry, 4 billion US dollars, and that will be used to turn our coal to hydrogen, and none of that is government money. And we will know more about that on March the 6th. I wanna be careful here, we're years away to get it happen, but we're at now at the point after a good year about talking about it. So March 6th uh, at the college, we'll be talking more about how the coal mine could stay open. So innovation. Uh, innovation, because we got to talk about this before we get to EVs, because this is what's behind it all. And if you were at the A1, AI1, sorry, this is 
repeat, but it's good to remind ourselves, what is innovation? Innovation is the disruption of processes. I prefer, I think the word innovation has become so buzzy that we forget what it actually met, means. And I, I'm actually leaning to the point of calling it dis disruption because it has positive and negative, and we need to be truthful about that, right? So um, innovation, where are we? Most, like, who here feels over-disrupted, over-innovated, right? Like, we just got computers, well, my age, we just got computers, then we got the internet, then we got the smartphone, and then, uh, and then it was boom, 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 boom. Suddenly it's just speeding up and accelerating. And then we need AIs here. And then we have to transition our energy. And then we have to drive EVs and all that wonderful stuff. It's just hitting us really, really hard. And historically, uh, like if you go back, um, this is fun, some of the fun stuff I've been learning at MIT lately, is that historically, like a, a empire or a uh, culture would only have one or two innovations over a period of time. I think the Romans are slightly different. Uh, and then that was that. Well, here's a graph of all the innovations and where we are in the history of the innovation cycle. So you can see first the big change of power was uh, water power that lasted about 60 years. Then we got to steam that lasted 55 years, then electricity 50 years. And you could just see it's getting shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter. So yeah. Uh, that's good. And the other good thing uh, that I also want to be aware of with all innovation, there is good and there is bad. I am not going to stand up here and say EVs are good. It's just they are. Um, I think anyone would never stand up and say a new invention is good or bad. It just is. Um, so a good example is Alfred Nobel um, invented dynamite, right? We couldn't build roads without dynamite, but that kind of stuff is used in wars. Um, so out of his, when he passed away, um, he actually, sorry, they thought he had died. And um, they posted his, uh, art, sorry, they posted his obituary early before he had died. And he was, sorry, I got to remember how he was labeled. The merchant of death is what they called him in his obituary, and he didn't like that. So when he actually did die, he willed all his money to the Nobel uh, Association for Prizes and the Peace Prize. So a little interesting thing about that. Um, oh, and then one more important thing. Sorry, I know I maybe it's been fun lately. Innovation. Here is the innovation cycle. So, and I'll explain where we are in EVs. So we, you get somebody has some neat idea, then the cool kids happen. So um, the Apple Pro Vision, the cool kids now have it, but we can't afford it yet. And then there's this chasm. And this is actually where I think AI is, is kind of, everyone's really excited and we're about to hit this chasm. And then after that, um, other people will start looking at it. A lot of things will actually end up dying here, like the beta track, Sony beta. I'm aging myself, but the you know tech that you've seen and go. Uh, some of it will die here, and then slowly what will happen is it will come back, and then here, the laggards, that's like uh, people going back to vinyl, though vinyl has a good place. Um, but essentially what happens is everyone gets super excited with EVs, right? So. In the EV current modern EV cycle of where we're at, about two or three years ago, two years ago, three years ago, everyone got super, super excited about EVs. Everyone over said, oh, everyone's going to be driving EVs all in two or three years. Gas is dead, right? And it didn't happen. That is normal for the all innovation cycle. That is kind of like here. But what's happening is it's continuing on and we're right about here. And that's just my opinion. So um, now the thing about, I will say about uh, politics when it comes to EVs is from running a, a software company for so long, I know intuitively technology will only succeed if it actually answers a real need. There's a lot of neat, cool gadgets out there and gadgets that never become something because they never answered a real need. And change must come from the roots. So in my opinion, right? So anything that's ever taken well in our, in our society started with the roots, not with mandates, not with laws. So 
me personally on this one subject, and this only time we'll bring up politics, I completely and utterly disagree with an EV mandate. For EVs to exist, they must answer a real need and people must want to buy them. So on that one subject, because I know it's going to come up, I am not for any EV mandate. That's just my personal opinion. Okay, so now let's talk about uh, Thethoris Dictionary. So um, just to save me time bouncing around with saying the same thing over and over again, just to shorten my life, EV, we know this one, not a lot of people might know this, but this is what us EV people call in, uh, gas engines. We just call them ice engines, meaning internal combustion engine. Great. So believe it or not, the EV hasn't only been around for 10 years. Just something really fun until I get break down the, the, um, the history of EVs. Uh, Henry Ford and his wife had a little spat the whole time they were alive. She refused to buy, Clara Ford, Ford refused to drive one of his cars. She had to drive an EV. She said that uh, it, the gas cars were smelly and made too much noise. So that must have been a fun marriage. Um, and then here is a hilarious um, ad from way back in the day about batteries. I think this was like 1890s, 1905. And even back over 100 years ago, the battery will outwear your car. So even then, they were having the same debates and discussions that we're having now. So, that was, so that's kind of fun. So let's talk about the history of EVs. The Scottish are to blame, as they are for everything, uh, including what the telephone. Yeah, American, Canadian, no Scottish. Uh, anyways, the uh, so Scottish inventor of the first electric-powered vehicle, 1832, Robert Anderson. The unfortunate thing about this EV is they were like the traditional batteries that we would used to use back in the day. So you drive, pull out the battery, throw it away, and can't use it, put a new battery in. It's kind of funny. Um, but then where things really took off was with uh, Thomas uh, Davenport. So he created what now would be considered the grandfather of the first electric motor. And that was done in 1834. Who here likes Porsche? This is the first Porsche ever made, and it's electric. And it was made, it was a P1, stole it from McLaren, uh, 1898. So around 1898, um, Thomas uh, Parker in London created the first uh, production line for electric vehicles. And then William Morrison uh, introduced the electric wagon uh, in the United States. So 1880s, 1890s, um, powered vehicles, which wasn't that many, but powered vehicles were almost all electric. There was none, almost no gas vehicles. It's kind of fun. But what killed the EV at that time? Well, that thing, the electric starter. Because, um, well, two things. One, as is now, gas cars were cheaper, right? Because you didn't have the, the battery, you just had an empty container that held fuel. So that keeps the cost down. But the reason why, the final reason why people would go electric was cranking the old gas cars could kill you. People, some people would die. Some people would break their arms. So the minute the starter came out, uh, it was first in, uh, in 1903, but the Model T Ford in 1920 put them in all its vehicles. And from that point, or 1919, from that point forward, all, elect, all gas cars had... Um, or most gas cars had electric starters, and that's what killed the EV back then. So let's talk about electric motors for a sec. So I know there's a lot more knowledgeable people in Esteban about electricity than I, <laughs> to say the least. So I'll just, but there's also others that always tell me to keep things um, less technical. So I am going to do my best and be in the middle. So this is an electric motor. These are permanent battery um, magnets. So you know with, uh, as a kid, playing around with magnets, that's what these are. Then you got your coils of wire. If you take a uh, wire and you put an electric current through it, there is an electromagnetic field going around it. And so you got your north and your south. It's invisible, just like with permanent uh, magnets. but it's there. And when you have a south against a north and a north against a south, 
positive against it, you know, however you want to say it, it causes it to spin and that's what causes it to turn. Now there are some valid concerns about these permanent ma magnets um, that they can be made by using rare earth minerals and they are very hard to find um, and where they are found um, it's not good labor practices. Uh, so uh, Tesla and a lot of different companies have stopped using permanent magnet motors and they're using, um, they use, so there's AC and DC, alternating current and direct current. And if you don't know, like direct current is just you, you're just going this way. This is the best way to explain it if you don't know anything. And then alternating is like, nope, nope. Best way to describe it, right? So you're constantly changing polarity from plus to minus. Best way to explain it. Trying to keep it simple. Um, but here's a really interesting thing. Not that many moving parts in that motor, right? So on average, an electric motor in an EV will only have 20 parts. On average, an ICE, ICE engine has around 2,000 parts. So when people are talking about maintenance costs of EVs versus gas, that's the core reason why. Less moving parts, less things to wear, less things to break. So, uh, transmission. That's a ICE car's transmission. That is a lot of moving parts. So beyond the motor's moving parts, EVs don't have transmissions because they can go up to 20,000 RPM and the neat thing is they don't, if you look at the pyro, power cycle of an EV motor, they don't really lose much power and torque where that's why with a gas engine you start to lose some, so you gotta drop and change your motor and you lose efficiency. But you don't really have that with an electric motor. So we don't have these things. The negative is, yes, EV owners who drive over like 110, 120, we start to feel a bit of the efficiency. So some of the, like the, the Porsche Taycan, I think you can get a second speed in so that you can ke keep some of that range and efficiency further on. Batteries, my favorite subject. And you'll see why. I'm going to about show you one of my heroes in a sec. So essentially, this is the very simple version of a battery, but the parts are most this is the most important part. You got your anode, which is your negative, and you got your cathode, which is your positive, and then you got your electrolyte. And in a throwaway Duracell or uh, battery, say, um, the electrons just go through, negative to positive. I love how physicians, John, I know you're following this, but physicians and um, electricians disagree on which way the polarity goes. But I did physics, so I'm going to say it goes from negative to positive. Um, now to recharge, they just it reverses that, um, and I'll explain that some more in a minute uh, or right now. So this is a lithium-ion battery. Part of my motivation to do this is that there are a number of manufacturing and industrial jobs that could be coming to Estevan with regards to the supply chain of batteries, and one of that is lithium. So uh, in our community, you've got. Arizona lithium, formal, formerly known as prairie lithium, they're the more well-known ones where they're using uh, the oil rigs to pull the brine out from underground and that brine contains lithium. So if that were to play out well, we will be, people will be working here on that supply chain. So it's good to know what the heck is all this lithium all about. So um, you've got your, this is just kind of like a more uh, complex version of that battery, but you, what happens is the lithium will travel, ions will travel from the positive to the negative or the negative to the positive through a membrane. And then, um, and then, then you got your electrolyte. So it depends on which way it's getting charged. Now, the problem with some of this is that you can start to grow called dendrites. So dendrite is like a spike. So what happens is the lithium moves back and forth. It can get left behind and start to make a little spike of lithium. A minute that lithium goes through this membrane, the whole cycle breaks and no longer works. So that's where people are concerned about degradation. Um, what's interesting is, and I'm sure fellow EV drivers here know, know this from lived experience, is the concerns about 
degradation. Oh, wow, I can't even say that right now. Um, batteries no longer working, shall we say, is um, initially started. So the first modern EVs on mass production uh, were put into Arizona, and that is very hot down there. And like the original Volkswagen Bug Beetle, remember, they had no heat exchange. It just sat there and it was supposed to just cool itself. And same, the same thing that happened to those original motors happened to those batteries without thermal management, they got hot. And the hotter it got, this is like uh, ch chemistry in here. And the when you make things hot, reactions happen. And those reaction caused the uh, dendrites to grow. Um, I'll get back to that in a minute because when we talk about um, range, there is, we need to come back to that for a sec because there is a good reason for that. One of my heroes, that's actually his name. <laughs> I'm not exaggerating. This guy only, no, oh, that's supposed to be 23, my apologies, only passed away last year. He was working in a chemistry lab until the day he died. He created RAM. <laughs> but he also created the lithium ion battery and the lithium iron phosphate battery, which I'll get to in a sec. Actually, no, I can talk about that in a minute. And we're all hearing about glass batteries. He's the guy who did all that. And he got the Nobel Prize in 2019 when he was like 98 or 99 years old. I think he was the old... There you go. The oldest person ever to get the Nobel Peace Prize. The Nobel Prize. Pretty amazing guy. That name is just perfect. Uh, the reason why I point out lithium iron phosphate is this is the new type of battery that's out there. Um, I might as well talk about quickly now. Is that the cobalt batteries that you heard a lot about? Um, they hold more um, charge, more energy per kilogram, but beyond just cobalt, they are more expensive to manufacture because they have more rare minerals in them, where iron is everywhere. It's one of the most plentiful elements in, on our earth. And so it really helps control that. The other thing is, um, there's a wonderful, bit, um, who here has iPhones? Going off subject. So your phone is made by, not by Apple, it's made by a company in China called BYD. BYD has been making batteries for 40 years. And uh, they got, so they initially then started making batteries for smartphones, cell phones. And then they got the contract in China to make your iPhones. So um, that BYD company, or one of the first to come out with mass production uh, lithium iron phosphate batteries. And um, they have a hilarious video <laughs> where they take a a battery pack from uh, out of a car. They uh, have a robot put a nail through it and it's fully charged, 100%. Put a nail through it. They take that battery and they put it back in the car and then this poor guy drives it. I, th I, th I think he's poor guy. He then drives it out and says, look, it didn't catch on fire. So <laughs> I think like, that guy had a lot of nerve. But they only have been in production on mass production for about two years there is yet to be a single iron phosphate EV battery fire in the world. So it's really showing, uh, so it's less of those nasty, those minerals and um, cheaper. It doesn't hold as much charge per kilowatt. Interesting thing on cobalt, do you know the number, according to the Cobalt Institute, the international cobalt, do you know what the number one use for cobalt is? You got it. Yeah, and you're in oil and gas, right? So they use it to remove sulfur when they're going through the refinery. So just to think about that. Just quickly about lithium ion batteries. Actually, no, I'm going to go back to one more thing. Um, in here, there's also graphite. So graphite is usually, I think it's the cathode. So a, one of the ways that we're all working here with our m money that we get from the government is to um, turn our coal to graphite. So um, this, we're working with, uh, the money's coming through the Department of Defense in the United States. Um, and they've been funding uh, University of George Washington 
and they they are about five six years into a process where they're now using because uh, they've been chasing all these different biomasses different organic things to turn uh, into graphite because graphite is really hard to get a hold of um, and our lignite coal as it is excellent for hydrogen is excellent to turn to graphite so we're all working really hard on that process and hopefully we will there'll be another way to keep our mind open um, it's kind of neat coal is a space age material there's so many cool things you can do it so lithium ion battery that's just the quick breakdown of the original lithium ion battery, but the, the lab work was done in, 19, in the 1970s, right? So we didn't see this to market until, really until like the late 2000s when we saw it en masse. So think about that, when you're looking at, at new technology, you're watching, hey, there's this new battery, oh, there's this new whatever, and it's in the lab, just remember it takes 20 to 30 years to get it into mass production. So something to think about. Um, and then John B. Goodenough made the lithium iron phosphate battery, which I already talked about. He did that in 1996. So Alistair, how old would he be in 70s? Yes. Awesome. Okay. In battery chemistry, because again, I could just made a million slides. Just with battery chemistry, anyone have any questions? Any myths or things that you think are myths or not too sure? No question is stupid. Yes, Terry. Okay, so the recycling is the I love it. Thank you. I forgot that whole section. So there's a great for profit company called uh, LiPo out of Toronto. So it's a Canadian company. They've now built a number of plants in the United States, and they and uh, we've been cold calling them, asking them to set up shop here because we are, are got this wonderful railway that can connect all the way to Mexico. Great place to set up shop, and they can fully uh, recycle all lithium type batteries, including the EV batteries. And what comes out is a uh, black dust. And that black dust, because it's full of all these amazing minerals, is worth $10,000 a pound. So that finally being cracked. Uh, the British Columbia government, because that's where it came from, when you buy, uh, sorry, they have a government-funded recycling program, and uh, EV batteries have to go through there. So, yes, Terry, again. So Oh, and then you can then use use that to break it because the dust contains all the elements, the lithium, the cobalt, the manganese, the phosphate. So then that goes off through normal um, recycling of other metals that are already in place. The problem with EV batteries is that the reason why it was so hard to recycle them in the first place is that there is so much um, plastic and epoxy and copper and all these other things wrapped up and around in the battery pack. So it was how can you separate all that economically? So they finally did that, making that black dust. We already know how to recycle mineral, uh, metals, so it just went further on. But a big hole, though, was the lack of batteries to do it. Then. That's another good question. Yeah, thank you for comment. <laughs> Everyone, a lot of the, back in what, 2019, 2018, um, there was a real push by for-profit companies to recycle batteries, thinking that there would be this big supply chain and a lot of money to be made. But batteries are lasting so much longer that they're like, you're not giving us anything to recycle, help us out. <laughs> so it's kind of neat. My, my Kia EV Nero has 80,000 kilometers on it, and I still don't physically see any range loss. And when they plug it into the computer, they still don't see any range loss on the computer or degradation. You guys the same? 6% over 96,000 Yeah, Tesla Model 3? Why? Why? But that was, majority of that was like the first six months? Really? Eight months? Yeah, I've heard that from others too. Yeah. If your car- It's never actually on the actual test on it, just based on yeah, mileage. What, what the mileage says versus yeah. draining it dry when you go after the proper check. I should do that soon. I'm scared to drain it dry. How about you guys? You're, I know you're new. Two new. Two new. You guys? I've never So you have nothing major to notice. Yeah. 
are the lithium ion phosphate batteries are they in production? Yes. Going into cars right now? Yes. The BYD is doing it. Oh. Okay. And they're so much cheaper. So much cheaper. That's one graph I should have put up is the um, Gordon Moore with an extra O, who was the uh, CEO of Intel. I wish I took a mortgage out on his name before he died. Um, so he has a thing called Moore's Law. And it it was around uh, semiconductors for computers. And, and, and what we, that simply meant is, as we have seen, um, computers have significantly dropped in price. Cell phones have significantly dropped in prices. The same with batteries. It's something like what? We're down to like 18% of what the cost of a lith per kilowatt hour of what it was in 2010. It's crazy. And that's the main cost of a EV. To that point, I put $500 down on a Kia EV5, which will now have 700 kilometer range. And without any subsidies, it's $40,000. And it's supposed to be here next year. So- How does uh, that compare in size to the six? Is it smaller? Thing? Yeah, it is. And it's it's more like, I have my Kia Nero outside. So it's more like a, an SUV or a, a CUV. So, for a guy who's got rid of all his kids, it's perfect for me. Oh. Which one do you have? Do you have one? No, I don't know. I'm just curious. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So EV chargers, the fun one. So the big important thing, I see this constantly when people are debating, <laughs> you're laughing your head off, about EV chargers. Oh my God. A 350 kilowatt EV charger is going to like, that's equal to house. No. Kilowatt is power without the H. That's how powerful it is. With the H is how much energy that is. I will translate this to ice. That's how fast the fuel comes out the pump or can come out the pump. That's how much, um, so your gas, and that's how much gas your tank holds or uses. It's the best way to describe it. So saying I've got a 350 kilowatt, like, no, that's like take what you're saying is you got a big hose, but you're not going to turn that hose on for an hour. You're going to turn it on for a few, a few minutes where a little hose to, to fill up your car or your tank or whatever is going to take longer. So it's still all the same amount of energy, still the same amount of fuel in your gas tank. So this important piece, it took me a while, I'll admit, to get used to this. I'm sure you were the same way. We have one person in that group that, it's kilowatt hours, it's kilowatt. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. I love them. EV chargers, types. Okay, level one, you just plug it in at home. This is what I've been doing for three years unless I'm on a road trip. Uh, block heater. So when we I first moved to Estevan, the... Uh, the units that we rented before we left was owned by a guy just down the street in West Vancouver. He had a Tesla. He agreed I could pay him $40 more per month. And I could just plug into the block heater. Um, when I'm in Vancouver, that's all I do. Uh, or when I'm traveling at a hotel, block heater. Just, hey, can I just, and they're oh, yeah, sure, go ahead. So there's that. Level two, so that's actually a bit of a myth or a misunderstanding. If you're living in, in a city or in Estevan and you're not driving too far and you have a, an efficient car, you can probably just get away with that. Level two, this is the same plug as an electric dryer or electric stove. Literally, it's the same plug. You can get an adapter that has the electric stove plug and you plug it in and out comes the other side is the, the plug type. So I know there's a lot of misinformation going around and confusion with regards to amps. So you can go all the way down to 12. You don't need 64. It's actually probably overkill to go all the way up to there. I think most people are actually down here. Um, that's 7 to 20 kilowatts uh, per hour. Sorry, 7 to, yeah, kilowatts. Just, sorry, to give you some idea, when you look at 1 to 2, 7 to 20, a EV battery right now in our region that's of any use is about 64 to 88. If you're going kilowatt hours. If you're going smaller than that, unless you live in Regina or Saskatoon, I wouldn't. So just think 66, 84, and then you can see these numbers. Um, I'll talk about charging two more in a sec about because there's some more fun stuff with that. Level three, 
So level three chargers, those are the big ones that you see over behind the mall. Or, or when you're driving around, you see these big, huge units. Um, they are, they suck when they're 25. <laughs> they really, really, all the EV owners, they really suck when they're 25. Ours are only 50, which is like, meh. Um, when we get into Alberta, United States, or British Columbia, um, you're getting up to 350, if your car can take it. So that's a super cool thing. Now, when you do charge your car, um, these top, you don't get these top powers all the time. As the batteries get uh, topped up, as they get more and more energy in it, the charger pulls down at how much power it puts into it, so it actually slows down. Though, comparing my wife's Audi uh, e-tron, it doesn't slow down until about 90%, 95%. It's going full throttle, where my Kia will start to slow down at around 50%. And that's just how quick the technology has gotten better over the last three years. Any question on speeds? Anybody run into some fun things or questions? What's the typical um, rate that uh, EV can charge? Oh, gosh. Because that's the reason why I stop. That's really changing quickly. Like 30 amp is pretty much the common. Oh, you're talking amps? Okay. Well, 30 amp, 240. Like what, kilowatt hours? No, that's where I'm going. Yeah. Over like level three? Or like a modern one that you charge at their top speed? But then the Cybertruck's got the one megawatt. So 1,000 kilowatts. <laughs> Plug it into the SMR directly. Yes. Driving it, you get to the edge of Saskatoon, you're down to whatever, and you want to charge the car. <laughs> yes. And you get to a charge. How long? How long to charge the car sufficiently? Say you've got another hundred kilometers to go. How long does it take to charge that car? Thank you. That is a brilliant question. So, how long would it had take? The best way to answer it is how long would it had taken with the Tesla Roadster or the Nissan Leaf back in 2010? Uh, to say dry, let's do miles because the or kilometers driven because the batteries are a lot smaller back then. But it would be like four or five hours of charging for here to Regina. Okay. Now with my car that is three years old, it would be if the right chargers were there, which they're not. Uh, it it would be around half an hour to forty five minutes. With Nazi, my wife's. Yeah, e-tron, which is a little bit faster, she's getting down to 20, 25 minutes. I have, what do you guys experience with your Teslas? Usually like when we're on a, like a long road trip where we've made like multiple stops, we do stop for like anywhere from like 10 to 25 minutes, kind of depending. Yeah. But the plug into the car, the car tells you where to stop and for how long. And yeah. Kind of, you know, you think about it. When uh, we went to the East Coast, by the time we walked in, went to the bathroom, grabbed the coffee, let the daughter run around for five minutes, the car was already ready. Yeah. So, yeah, like the car is like constantly telling us to go. Yeah. yeah. So, so the car is ready to go, but we're not quite ready yet. Yeah. So Terry, I can't say a de definitive because it's all completely different based on your car type and how old it is because just in the, where we are in the innovation cycle, it's just getting so much better and so much faster. Um, so that's the best answer I can give you. Sorry. Top speed that Tesla's charging was 1,200 kilometers per hour. Yeah. See, Tesla's does kilometers per hour where we do just energy, but. Well, it says both. Yeah. Can you. Can... you but like the longest also... we've ever had to charge for, like ever, yeah. went from like almost nothing to 100% in minus 25 <laughs> in the middle of Montana. <laughs> was one hour yeah. to go from nothing all the way to the tippy toppy and then we had to there was nothing in between there and us like we had yeah, to yeah. make it yeah, been there. because North Dakota is a dead zone yeah. so, so would that be Glendag or where was the yeah, it was okay. yeah. so uh, have your car you just plug into the 120 yeah okay. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So that's the thing about charging speeds. It's like um, it's you just do it overnight. Yeah, it's like your it's like your uh, your phone. But the other neat thing that I quickly realized because 
with my videography, I'm traveling, traveling all, or maybe not so much lately, but uh, traveling a lot. And so what I would do would, would be, I would, well, I drove Vancouver to Estevan in January at minus 25 to minus 46, right? And so what I would do there is I would leave the hotel fully charged, plan where I'm going to eat lunch that's near a fast charger, eat my lunch while I was charging. And I love that trick because it used to be a lot of naughty heads. Like when you do road trips that are long, you would pull in, pay, you know, depending on your car, 60 to $100 on gas, and then you'd buy your food, right? Well, now, which is say 20 bucks, so 120. So you go to charge and at a fast charger, my car, the most expensive I've ever paid is 20 bucks. Usually it's around 17 at one of these higher speed chargers because you pay a premium. So it's so much cheaper. I don't mind waiting. And another way I also look at it is you look at your wage. Say you're paying 25 bucks an hour, right? So it costs you four hours of labor in your life to get a tank of gas in your car where it costs you, what, 45 minutes to charge up your battery. So, but that's just me. I'm being a goof. <laughs> yes, Terry. So now, now we've assessed that you need to allow time to charge. You can't just plug in and go to the bathroom and come back. You have to wait. No, you can leave. You can leave straight away? Yes. Because it will have taken enough charge to get you that 100 well, no, say you show up at a... Uh, you got there and you're on like this flat. Yeah, so you just plug it in, you just plug it in, turn it on, lock, like turn on the charger, lock the door and leave yeah, but, and walk away. But you oh. left, but you, my point is how, how long before you come back to do that extra, right? So it's dependent on the vehicle. Yes. Now, you've got all that, but what about the towing capability of... I don't tow. I've never needed to tow. I would look. I'm just, yeah, no, no. So towing cuts a range in half right now. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's a good question. And that actually brings up a point of batteries and, and where we are. Actually, uh, actually, I'll wait until it gets to the. No, 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 it's good. No, I love, I love a group discussion. I'll talk about the. When I get to the another section, efficiency, uh, more about that. Now the fun thing. Dum 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 dum. <laughs> <laughs> this is our horrible world right now of charging in North America. Well, in the world. Um, so, this is a level one charger. So this is me plugging it in at home using a 120, okay? This is the Nissan Leaf. Um, it's dead, it's dying, no one ever is using it. I'm sorry, Nissan Leaf people, good for you for doing it. And then this is where we are now. Yeah, we're there now. Um, so that's the higher speed. So in my car, you have this uh, up at the top and then this piece underneath it, and I just have a cap take that cap off, charge one. When I'm doing level two, there's I just take that piece and the whole thing clunks in and charges. And it's big. So what Tesla did is they combined these together. So this thing is smart enough that when I go to plug it in, it will know if it's a AC if it's a fast charger or a slow charger. So I don't have to do any extra little unplugs and it's so much smaller. So now, a lot of, this is Gord's personal opinion. <laughs> I don't like Apple either, sorry. The, um, this is really cool, this is amazing, but what's really going on, so everything's converting over to this because uh, uh, Elon made this uh, open source and said go at it. Because disruption, not a lot of people keep up with disruption because of politics and emotion and all those normal things in life. Uh, he is, as we know, slightly evil, shall we say. And so what he has done is he has Tesla battery packs. He has Tesla chargers, he has Tesla cars. So what he has done, he mass produces all his, the chargers, or Tesla mass produces all their chargers with battery packs. I think it's in Texas. Puts them on a concrete slab in a factory. Right? So 
like this one here behind the mall, that was probably made in Texas and they just drove it up and blunk. And um, where all the other guys, they have to build on site essentially. So they have to do all the wiring, all the conduit, all the, and put it in all on site. So he can do a big swath for like a fifth of the price or I shouldn't say he, the Tesla can do it for the fifth of the price of the other guys. The other thing, this is not relevant here, but in places in the world where they have tariff charges, where you pay more for electricity at day and then less at night. So he takes all the, the, all the battery packs in there and he, they purposely fill them up at the EV station when its price is low. I mean, I can't blame the guy. This is smart business. You fill up those batteries when they're low, knowing that, people are going to come in uh, and charge during the day when it's higher. You knowing your competition doesn't have these battery packs. So now you got bigger margins. So you combine that with this. And if EVs do end up going the way that they could, he could be, Tesla could be the new Exxon. Just a thought. It's smart business. So you saying they're DC power packs at the mall? They didn't do them here because we don't have tariff rating, oh. right? We have just one price in a pint at the time of the day. Yeah, but if it, um, he, they are also, right, he also is involved in solar panels and all that other stuff, and other people are doing that. So any other questions? There's so much to talk about. Okay. I am going to show you my glasses over there, Negan. Behind your oh. Thank you. So if you now the other question a lot of people have, which is extremely valid is, and I know Terry, you've asked me this a lot. Um, where do I go to plug when I'm driving? Right? So let me just, this is a great website to go to. It includes all the chargers, level one, level two, level three, it includes even RV parks that might have a, a 240. They allow you to go use it. So you can see all these different places to charge. So just want to. That awkward quiet. Have you seen the AI bot clicking, are you human? I love that, it's yeah. hilarious. So, those pins are all stations. So this is where we are now. When I drove my EV from Vancouver to Estevan in January 2022 in the winter, oh, it's not, sorry. You guys are also quiet and polite. Oh, whatever. I'll just stop it and restart it. Okay, great. So when I drove uh, two years ago, three years ago, uh, from Vancouver in the middle of the winter, there, this none of these were here. I don't even know that existed. And there was one here. I got here, and it was uh, four o'clock at night in the evening. It was minus forty-six, and all the there one there was the co-op. And yeah, there was just the co-op on Canadian Petro Canada. That was it. And they were all broken. And I was like, oh no. So found the hotel had a level two. It was minus 46. I was traveling with budgies. <laughs> I don't know if you've seen my TikTok videos, they're hilarious, but because I TikTok the whole thing. Um, so I just forget it. So I just got a hotel, plugged it in. Um, but now when you go there, there are all now, so three years later. Look at that. So in three years, so there was two. In three years, there's this now. And Weyburn exists now. Yeah, they've got chargers there. They're only 50s, but they're they're a nice little, like nice to have. Weyburn had a, uh, at the PT Mart, they had one previous. 
that was level two. These guys yeah, are now level, level threes. Three. Yeah, yeah. It's good to know, eh? Um, there's a big black hole here. Uh, but you can see back in my old haunt, like <laughs> <laughs> British Columbia has the highest adoption of EVs in North America. So, Pretty but decent power rate too. That, I was about to say that. It was seven cents a kilowatt hour. It was crazy. I think it's now up to nine. We're here with a carbon tax. It's 15, so which is 1.7. Yeah, it's crazy. Oh, yeah. No, you can. Every look at this. Every small community in British Columbia has a charger. And when, when you drop down to the States, it's the same thing. So even the largest capitalist country in the world has them everywhere. Uh, okay, let's go back. Uh, Negan, is anyone typing any questions? Actually, no. Oh, anyone on? Just one. <laughs> Just one. Okay, fun time. Yeah, fun time. Let's go. Let's get into the fun stuff. So uh, let's talk about <coughs> efficiencies because everyone's like, EVs are so cheap. So let's break this down. Why? Diesel engine, 41%. Um, I got these numbers off. Well, there you go. Heavy vehicles. So um, just, I'm trying to cite everything. 41% for efficiency, typically around 20. Gas-powered vehicles up to 37% typically around 20. So when you put $100 worth of gas in your car, 80% of that just did absolutely nothing. So just think about that for a sec. He did your cabin. Yeah, that's true, especially here. Good point. That's a really good point. Um, and we'll get to that one in a minute. So with an EV, it's anywhere between 70 to 80%, typically around 76%. Now, as we enter into a world that energy is becoming more and more valuable, um, there's another part to all this. If you wanted to move energy from A to B, one of the cheapest ways to do it is through electric current over high voltage power cable, right? Where with gas, it's a little bit more involved. So if you include the efficiencies don't take my word for it go online um, and you will see that those numbers while this will drop a little bit the efficiency numbers of energy from production to motion is even worse for uh, gas-powered vehicles so if that's a concern for you but let's turn this into some fun math so these are I didn't do cars because I know, well, I'm an Estevan. <laughs> so um, I like cars, but most people I get, you like trucks. So here you go. Here's the uh, efficiency rate. This is by the manufacturer. This isn't Gord. This isn't some electric vehicle plot. You can go look them up. They're there. So there you go. Nine, that's the range. I like how we're now doing liters per 100 kilometers, because why not change it every five years? But anyways, that's what we do. So uh, to go uh, 100 kilometers in those kind of vehicles, I, I went, I looked at the gas price down at uh, Petro Canada uh, like at two hours ago. So this is pretty valid. I'm sorry, I don't really know these rates. Um, so yeah, this is what it will work out per 100 kilometers based on those two pieces of math. I know in the real world, that's always a little bit different. So $26, $28 or $30 to go to Regina. All makes sense, anyone? Want to argue with me? It's okay, Ken. Okay. Um, okay. Diesel. So I know a lot of people like diesel. Uh, it's more efficient. So these are your. Uh, these are the what was listed uh, as the top uh, by Motor Trend, the top diesel trucks for. Um, and this is what Motor Trend listed as their. Uh, Efficiency rates. So um, actually, I forgot to put the dollar values there because I was running out of time. It's been a fun few days. So that's actually $14, $15. So it seems, does that fit with what people experience when they're out there driving around? Seems right. That's generous. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're not going to get those fuel economy numbers. No, because of wind. Well, 
Never yeah, assuming Never basically. Day, right? yeah. Okay, cool. So now let's have some. Uh, okay, so now let's. I, I didn't do Teslas. Uh, I didn't, or my car, because who here is going to buy one of those? I know. And I know who here is going to buy a Cybertruck. I don't disagree. I mean, cool, but. I don't know. I don't like the looks, but that's just me. So this is how they do uh, efficiency miles mileage in uh, electric vehicles. Oh, jeez, I'm so sorry about that. Uh, anyways, the uh, like I said, it's been a busy few days. The um, so we do kilowatts amount of energy per hundred kilometers. So just like liters. So this is the official rating by each manufacturer. Um, it's interesting because what I'm actually hearing from people who own these types of vehicles is actually unofficially it's more like that have you guys heard the same i've heard the rivian is better um if you're looking for uh right now at this moment in time if you did want to get a ev um pickup i would look at the rivian um it also um uh, pearson uh what's his brad pearson's uh, lot down here, Murray. They're going to have, get um, the problem with the Ford Lightning is all they did is they took the Ford F-150 and put electric motor and battery in it. They didn't purposely build it as an EV. So Murray, uh, Murray GM was going to have they been made so Chevrolet GM they made a test they made a EV pickup from scratch. So it's going to be a lot. It's not going to have as many problems as the 150. It shouldn't because they did it that way. But I would recommend the Rivian right now. Like if I went out right now, I'd be getting the Rivian. It looks like a normal pickup. It's got excellent reviews. Um, yeah. But this is what it would be. So nine, ten dollars instead of thirty dollars to get to uh, Regina in the summer. <laughs> in the summer, I'm not gonna lie. In the summer. So maybe we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. So that's, it's the efficiency of the electric system, that's what I'm trying to show here, that makes EVs cheaper to fuel. The other thing before I get into battery, uh, the next, the fun subject that everyone wants to know is um, where, why EVs, why you hear things about EVs suffering in the cold, wind, towing, it's not the motor. The drag lines here at the coal mine are electric on purpose. There's more power, there's more to torque. The locomotives that come down here, they're electric. They're diesel electric, where the diesel makes electricity that powers the electric motor because electricity is more powerful. So the only reason why, so when we talk about towing, you, you made a good point, right? You said it's 50% loss, both for electric and for gas. But the problem is battery technology isn't yet equal to a tank of gas. And when we do, it shouldn't be any big deal. That you can do whatever you want. Does that make sense, Terry and everyone? Yeah, okay, cool. Yay, let's talk about the fun one. Cool, so well, how do batteries catch on fire? It's a thing called thermal runaway. So something happens to the battery. Um, that point I said about the nail, um, say something like happens in a way that it causes short circuit, shall we say, or the chemistry within the battery is uh, destroyed or whatever, and it starts leaking everywhere. What happens is that will cause the first little cell that has a problem, it will start getting a little bit warmer. But that warmer, will cause the, as I was talking about with the dendrites, and then I was saying how about in Arizona, they, that's where they had the first electric batteries and the batteries degraded faster. Well, that's because there's an in, more energy in the system, more energy in the chemistry, so things happen faster, which then creates more heat, which then causes to go around and around and around and around. So when you hear uh, the truth about fire, fire is being hard to being put out with EV batteries. That is true, and that is why. But, but, 
gasoline is also flammable and very explosive as well, as is diesel. So, I mean, that's why we use it. It contains energy. So, um, in Sweden, now why did I choose Sweden? Because of its EV market rate. Um, it has 14% of the EV market rate, so we have bigger numbers to actually see the truth. So if you only have one or two numbers, you can't really do your statistics correctly. So there you go. Um, 23 EV car fires out of 600,000 EVs on the road, and that's 0.4%. 3,400 uh, ice gas car fires out of 4 million, that's 0.08%. It's gas, you are, gas cars are 20 times more uh, statistically more likely to catch on fire than an EV. It's just they don't get thermal runaways, EVs do. But it's also, it's not the car battery that's causing the fire. On the gas car, on the ice car, generally speaking, it's something else. Yeah, anything, but it's still, it's being fueled by the gasoline or the diesel within the car. No, no, that's good. good. And because I know this one is going to surprise a lot of people, that's where I got that. I noticed that like Motor Trend and all those those via, those um, media, they say the same thing. So, so when people tell you that you're actually, there was a funny thing. It was Kia Hyundai recalled two hundred and twenty thousand vehicles in Canada last. December and said, do not park them in your house. They're gas cars. So just saying. Uh, now, we can, just to look at the U.S. market, uh, just because it's closer to home, I couldn't find any Canadian numbers. The reason why I didn't lead with this is that it's a very small numbers that they are dealing with back in 2022. So um, more cars on the road, but just as market penetration. So this works out to be uh, 30 times worse then, uh, uh, sorry, gas cars 30 times worse, but we're dealing with smaller numbers. So I would choose to go with the Swedish numbers at this moment in time. But remember with iron phosphate batteries, which uh, they seem to be at this time catching, well, they haven't caught on fire yet <laughs> um, in an EV yet. So, and that's where I got that from. So if, I know that's a lot of surprise. On this question, oh, come on, does this surprise a lot of people? Yep. Cool. Okay, this one is the most important one for us living in um, Estevan. So my wife just thinks this is the best because we're very competitive. So her car is way better than mine. <laughs> so what this is, is yellow is uh, 21 degrees Celsius. Uh, blue is minus seven. I know we live at minus 40. There are a lot more better, more information out there. Um, if you want some, I can pass it on to you. This was just the better graph to give you a feel for what's actually happening. In my 2020 Kia EV Nero living in Saskatchewan, driven by me. So I'm saying it that way on purpose because I'm being honest. It's just the way I am and maybe I'm different. Uh, I will in this, my car is rated at 18 kilowatts per 100 kilometers in the summer. I get around, in the city, I can get down to nine or 10 uh, when it's like 20 degrees or warmer. Um, but it's going up to uh, Regina, it will get up to, oh, it depends. Uh, say no wind, about 19, 20. In the winter, uh, it will go to 22. So I went up for a meeting two weeks ago at minus 12 and I lost about 10%. I used 10% more than I normally do. It, the biggest thing here is it's about the car, right? So everyone's slightly different. That's the main thing I wanted to show with this graph. If you do want to get an EV here at this time, ensure it has a um, heat pump. Get one with a heat pump. If you don't have a heat pump, don't buy it. Uh, the Ford Mach-E, doesn't, from what I understand, unless they started putting them recently, heat pumps in them. They now do, yeah. Okay, so don't get that car here if you live here, unless you want to park it in the summer or in the winter. 
Um, and the other thing about heat pumps, and the reason why I showed this is um, there is a truth about heat pumps. If you just take cold air that's minus 40 and try to get enough energy out of it to heat something up, they, they, they fail. They don't do well. Um, but it's slightly different with an EV. EVs are, like I said, 75, 76% efficient. Where does that other 20, 25% of energy go? What well, goes off into heat? If you've ever flown a drone or played with a remote car, you will feel that the battery gets warm. So what this is showing here, this is an actual diagram of the heat pump in my car uh, from Kia. And so what it's showing is it's scavenging all the heat from all over the place, through the battery, through the motor, everywhere it can, and then it goes through the heat pump. So I find that the resistance heat in my car kicks in around minus 25 to 27. So I got a little computer in my car and it'll tell me what things are happening and I will notice a big jump in electric use around that point. I think the heat pump's still there, it's just kicking in with the uh, electric heat. The other amazing thing, so before my wife got her Audi, she always wanted to take my car in the winter. Always, 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 and I'm sure you guys, are, like, I don't have to warm up my motor to get to then get heat in my car. I just, I on my app, click, boom, and what, within five minutes, all the windows are defogged and it's fully warm inside. It's amazing how quick it is. So my wife was always, ah, I wanna use mine. Do you guys have the same experience with your EVs? Yeah. Really really cold in the yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, you don't, okay. No, fair, fair, fair. So first thing off, it would be using resistive heat. Like you're, you're not operating, so there's no battery heat to scavenge or... It's a good point. Yeah, no, it's a good point. Well, it depends on the temperature. The heat pump in my car will work just by pulling it like minus 25. But yeah, I've never thought of that. It'll pull. But it'd have to be really cold then for what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry? It would pull the heat from the air too, as long as it's not that minus 25. Yeah. And there was that thing that came out about three years ago where there was a problem with Tesla's heat pumps and everyone went, see? but then they fixed it with an over-the-air update because it was a software issue. Um, so uh, there's just, I could have kept going and making more and more slides. So how are we for time? Oh, good. So uh, just, I will do my best. You throw questions at me and I will do my best based on my lived experience of owning an EV um, to answer questions. Yes, Terry. I don't have a question. I just I did not know that. So let's, oh, talking about <laughs> uh, something, talking about the UK and EV. So there's a, there was um, information floating around saying that the UK would have to rebuild all its infrastructure and parkades because EVs were so heavy that they would st start to call that cause that infrastructure to collapse. Where you would, if you'd looked at the gross vehicle weight of a Y of my car, it is less than, you know, a Ram 3500. It's like, it's, we're in the same realm, we are heavier. Oh, another good one, um, let's jump back. Cause I, uh, to the motor. Free energy, let's talk about free energy. Stop it. <laughs> okay, so that's how we make things move. But say we stop putting electricity through that coils, then this would start stop spinning, right? Say we keep on stop using putting electricity through that, but we now make connect this to the wheel so that the wheel is now driving this. What happens is if you have a, a copper wire, say, and then you have a magnet and you spin it around, you've actually, you say that magnet is pulling the electrons through the wire. That's how you generate electricity. So a motor is exactly the same thing as a generator. It's just what you're doing with it. So what that means is that's how regenerative braking works. So when you are, and that's an alternator. That's how an alternator works. So when you brake in an EV car, it's not using mechanical brakes per se. It might sometimes, 
Um, but what it's doing is it's turning this into a motor. And because these are magnets, you know, when you pull things apart with a magnet, you get resistance. That resistance is what's slowing the car down. And in doing that, you put electricity back into your battery. So when people say, can't EVs just use an alternator to make electricity for free energy? We do already. It's our brakes. Any other, come on, throw. What are the fun things people, how about? When it comes to the charging networks, do you think that we're going to hit, we have a Tesla, but right now the Tesla networks are not charging. Do you think that we're going to hit? Yes. Anywhere we drive, rub it in. there's never any problems so far. Thank like, you, just rub it in. <laughs> <laughs> like, so people to a Tesla charger, typically we're the only people there. Or maybe there might be one other person, but we never have to. Oh, you haven't been to Hope BC then. We have not. <laughs> but do you think now that it's open source technology and everybody else is hopping on the trend, are we going to see where the charging infrastructure, like right now, we are easily able to charge minus these like few hot spots. Are we going to hit a point where the charging infrastructure has not quite caught up to the number of people that are trying to use the Tesla chargers? I think it's just like normal market, uh, like, normal so business cycle. It's just going to do like this and do this and do this and do this. Because I also believe firmly that the charging station sh should be matching uh, what the for-profit companies can make a profit. Because at the end of the day, we live in a capitalist society, and therefore someone has to make money or else it won't exist unless we're talking healthcare or something, right? So who is going to invest money until there's demand? But then as we all know, uh, when there's a lot of demand, everyone gets all excited all at one time and then builds out for that demand and then there's an overabundance of something. So lithium prices is a good example, right? We, lithium was really expensive and every, uh, worth a lot of money and everyone was getting all excited. So then everyone started going out there trying to find lithium. Everyone found lithium, pumped up the lithium supply chain, and now lithium drop, pr dropped. So uh, it's all the same. It's just, yeah, yes and no. Yes, we will likely hit a pain point that we will catch up. And then we will hit a pain point, and then we'll catch up, and then we'll hit a pain point. So. Yes. In what way? But there's just nothing there. Oh, there's it's worse than Saskatchewan? What? Is it worse than Saskatchewan, Manitoba? Really? Dakota and Montana are terrible. Yeah. Hmm. Like, Interesting. Tesla has made it like you can like just. I mean, it's really just like the first like 200 kilometers at least. So as soon as you go east to west, there's more what? chargers going across the state. But if you're so, making a dash for the border, you're in trouble if it's minus 25 and you forgot that. COVID changed the work sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Experience. Yes, Terry. So I have two questions. Sure. The first one, is anybody here a hybrid owner? And is that, was anybody a hybrid owner and has swapped purely to? We have a hybrid as well. We have a hybrid as well. But it's parked. Mostly, yeah. Unless we need a controller. It's for towing. It's for towing. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And it's built by Ford. And the only place that knows is Okay. <laughs> um, just, so that's a good point. I should have talked about that. So there are gas cars, there's EV cars, but there's hybrid. And then there's plug-in hybrid. So uh, hybrid is what we all think of. You don't plug it in. It's just using that regenerating brake power that I showed you where the motor becomes it. And just using that to recapture and put in energy. Then you've got a plug-in hybrid, which is you actually have a battery and you can do like 80 kilometers, 90 kilometers on electric. And then when you run out, it kicks into, um, into gas. Or if you're going at a high speed or you're hitting a wind or what have you, it'll kick into that. So that I think if you're not sure and you're anxious to going full EV, but you want to do something, that is a really good option. The thing to be aware of the hybrids is that if you're always doing electric, uh, the gas, the fuel is organic. It will go bad after a while. So just be aware of that. 
and the other is um, the brake pads. So like with uh, EV owners, it's always the EVs are more going to use regenerating power braking, less mechanical, where a hybrid will be, um, no, am I doing this wrong? No, forget what I just said. Just be aware. <laughs> yeah, no, never mind. But yeah, um, the only, no, the one thing that I personally went through in my mind is I did some research and realized that the cost savings in maintenance over an EV, if you get get a hybrid, you don't get that because you have to do the maintenance on a gas car still. That's what I was trying to say. Thank you. The plug-in hybrid, uh, when it's running on gas, does the gas motor run a generator to make power? Or does it run like a normal ice? They do both. So the BMW's EV, the very first one that they ever did, I think it was the i3. It was those ugly little like for two car type of things. Well, some people thought they were cute. My friend got one. So, if you, But um, it would be battery and electric. And then it had a little Honda type generator in the back. that would, And it sounded like a little Honda when it kicked out. And then it would make electricity. Um, but then another ones are just like a normal hybrid where they assist so, I, which there's a pickup that's doing that now. Yeah. Is it the, okay? Um, the other one is uh, people will say that, um, and this is fair. Um, your bad, your tires will wear out faster in an EV. And what they're finding out in, and this surprised a lot of people, but they figured out why. Um, people thought because EVs are for their cl class. The heavier one, so the more weight, the more um, the tires will wear out. But what's fi they're finding out is that's not true, because the way mechanical braking works relative to regenerating braking, you're putting less pressure on the tires, so they wear out less. You have a different patch on the ground when you go to brake, so it doesn't squish down on it as hard. If you're interested, I can send you for more information. It's it's hard to say; it's easier to visualize it. Would it be the same for itself? I think we all who drive EVs are like, hey, watch this. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know for that one. So any other questions? Such a quiet group. Anything online? No. Do you follow Edison Motors at all? Oh, the guy's out of merit? Yeah, love, love him. Love him. So Edison Motors is a logging truck driver. Uh, he did TikToks and YouTube videos just as a logging truck driver. He was hilarious, great guy. And then he started making, um, he wanted to make EV trucks for the same reason as diesel electric trains, for the same reason as our drag lines. But he came to understand that just like our locomotives, you needed to have a diesel generator powering a, um, a electric motor. Uh, so that's what he's doing. So in a way, it's more like a semi-trailer diesel hybrid that you can plug in. I think that's the best way. But Zanika, I sent him a message saying, I run an incubator in Estevan. It's flat. We've got lots of resources. People would love to help you out. Uh, come and set up a shop here. But he never replied. <laughs> <laughs> Next time I'm in BC, I'll go say hi. Is there a brand that you think is, is a better option for an EV? If you're getting a car, if you don't want to get a Tesla for whatever reasons, then I appreciate that. Like, in okay, I'm going to be a goof. In BC, I'm sorry. If you in Vancouver, Tesla means you money launder. You, <laughs> it's like the Rover Land or the uh, Range Rovers mean that you are a drug dealer. It's the same thing. So, I couldn't get a Tesla, but. Um, the so I got a Kia near a Kia Nero and, and at the time they were ahead of the game and they're still the Kia Hyundai they're all one company it's like Toyota Lexus uh, the uh, way ahead just they're just killing it right now um, and mainly because um, interesting side note for what I'm going to present on March 6 uh, about the coal hydrogen process. The United States spends the most public government money and private money than any other nation on applied research and product development. That's per capita. So of course, because they get the learning, but per capita, uh, or sorry, per GDP, sorry, per GDP. South Korea is tied with them. So South Korea is where Kia Hyundai come from. It's where LG Chem is. 
right? And SK batteries. So they've just put so much money in there that they're just way ahead. So I know Kia used to mean crap in America and it probably still is with gas cars, but when it comes to EVs, they're way ahead, which is really weird because Toyota is way behind and Toyota and gas cars are like the best thing you could buy, right? So. Is Toyota behind because they're hoping for hydrogen and could that pose a threat to the EV network and... I love this subject. Okay, everything I'm about to say is my opinion. <laughs> okay, so uh, there was a, let's talk about hy hydrogen. And actually, um, because we're going turning our coal to hydrogen, we're going to use 4,000 tons of coal a day. So it could keep you know the mine at least half the mine workers working. Um, I'm really involved in this right now in the whole supply chain. So the thing with hydrogen is that, uh, well, let's go, there was a company in North Vancouver called Ballard Fuel Cells. A fuel cell, but they were created in 1994. What a fuel cell does is you put hydrogen past a metal and that metal is like a catalyst that says, gives the hydrogen some energy and excitement that then combines with the oxygen in our atmosphere and makes water. And when the oxygen and the hydrogen combine, it releases an electron. So, so your byproducts is water and you get electricity. So I was super excited, excited about that way back in the day. I was, thought it was really neat technology. The problem with that is, and this is where Esteban could really do some amazing things in the world with our coal. The problem with that is 98% of all hydrogen comes from natural gas. So if the market and business pressures right now on passenger vehicles are coming from customers want to reduce their carbon footprint. And I'm, when I say customer, I'm not talking about us individual, I'm talking about the mass of humanity of six billion people on the earth, that market are making over all those demands. So that killed hydrogen in so many ways. There, the cool thing about our hydrogen here is that it's showing that through the lab work that we've done over the last six months to a year, that um, that hydrogen out of our coal uh, is going to be cheaper than the hydrogen that comes from um, natural gas, and uh, so it, it it and because we have the CCS already here, they they this group is already talking to PTRC, the guys who run our CCS system, and they want to buy that carbon dioxide and sell it to Whitecap Resources for enhanced oil recovery. So that means we can make hydrogen that's green. And actually, there was a the univ there's a group down in Chicago that certifies what type of hydrogen it is. Is it green or not? And the uh, the results back from two days ago is that because and it's based on how much carbon dioxide is produced per how much hydrogen is created. Ours would be net zero if actually not ne ne negative if we use solar to so amazing, amazing possibility. I'm not saying this is going to happen. We're just moving along quite well. The problem now, so the problem with passenger vehicles is, so South Korea and, Jap and Japan both spent a significant amount of applied research on um, hydrogen cars. Beyond what I just was talking about, the other problem is you have to store your hydrogen in a liquid form. So... Anyone know what absolute zero is? I know John does. Oh, yeah, good for you. So absolute zero is the temperature, the lowest possible temperature in the, our universe. That's when all molecules cease motion, right? Hydrogen has to be 20 degrees above that, so minus 250 degrees Celsius to stay as a liquid. So it doesn't take much to boil, and when it does, you lose, you lose it. So you have to keep liquid hydrogen in your vehicle at minus 250 degrees doesn't work. Oh, in North Vancouver, they did, Shell put up a fuel station there, a hydrogen fuel cell station there that anyone could use. And Toyota started selling their hydrogen cars there. But um, it was something like two hours, like if you went to fill up your car, you, the next guy had to wait two hours for the hydrogen to recompress and everything. So it, it just didn't work. Uh, where hydrogen will work, in my mind, if I was a betting, well, a betting man, I am now because what we're doing with the coal, there is no there way we're going to electrify our combines. 
we're not going to put power outlets all through the prairies. It's just not going to happen. Like not in my lifetime. So what, what's next? We, the consumer is demanding less, uh, car, like making demands on the f supply chain, right? So how do you handle that? So one is hydrogen. So if we take our hydrogen uh, that we're, and I am through this process, talking to certain people at certain farm equipment supply companies, come here, we got hydrogen, we got farming, see if it works. Theoretically, a hydrogen combine will use, will cost, your fuel costs will be 25% of what they are now. Not reduced by 25%, 25%. That's theoretical. So, so, and again, that comes back to my belief is technology only works if it can supply, a, like, a, 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 meet a need, right? So that's my hydrogen. Oh, hydrogen could work in airplanes, though. A canister in the air at 35,000 feet trying to stay at minus 250, I'm not sure, but they'll figure it out. So a pressurized tank, like if you pressurize it though, you could store it? So True, yes, because you're putting the pressure to keep it more liquid and less gas. The company that we're working with, uh, with this process here, because we're gonna have to store and move it, uh, we're, they have the intellectual property uh, that NASA uses to store hydrogen and transport hydrogen, uh, which is kind of cool because NASA, the space shuttle, that's hydrogen. So though Tesla is using kerosene or methane now, but hydrogen is good. Anyways, I can nerd out for hours. So no threat to us with the network? For, for which? Hydrogen. It's not gonna transplant electric vehicles and therefore cease the- My guess the is that. Yeah, my guess is that um, I could be wrong. Those are just totally my opinion. Um, you know, you, we never know until we turn around and look backwards and see what happened. All right. So. Yeah. So if you were to make a recommendation for a hybrid, what would it be? But, and thank you, because if I were to make a recommendation I it, for uh, people in Estevan who want to try something different, um, and they're curious about this and they drive a lot, I would definitely do a hybrid, a plug-in hybrid actually. I wouldn't do a hybrid. So that way when you're around town or just going to Stoughton or whatever, those fuel costs that I showed you, those savings, that's what you would get. Um, and the problem with uh, pickup trucks is just their aerodynamic, lack of aerodynamicness, hence the why the, the cyber truck looks so way it does, one of the reasons. Um, so, um, yeah, I would get a plug-in hybrid. Uh, what type of pickup? I honestly wouldn't know. Because when I started looking at some of them, anyone have some thoughts? Because when I started looking into some of the plug-in hybrid pickups, they don't all have great ratings. I don't know. We have a hybrid but it's not plug-in, though, is it? No. no. For ease of use, I would say whichever you have, you have the closest Yeah. 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 Are you looking for a pickup? Yeah, my next vehicle. Well, no, I don't think I'm going to. I'm going to keep the pickup I've got. But yeah, I think I want to mess you these. I'd definitely go. Uh, Brad didn't pay me, but I just following the U.S. following the EV market. They purposely took their time. They didn't run out the door. All right, and so. Um, and same with Dodge, instead of jumping on it and rebuilt and built from the ground up. I know they're having software issues. They uh, had to call recall their first EV, but that was software issues. Um, the same thing happened with Volkswagen, actually, is software. It had nothing to do with, and the software of the infotainment unit, not of the EV. But I would be watching, the minute he gets one in, go check it out. So. So you're talking Murray's? Yeah, Murray's. Is, is it the Blazer? Yeah, the Blazer. Yeah, oh, isn't no plug-in? No, okay, or plug-in hybrid. Okay. It's kind of like a friend of mine just got in a car accident, and as, as did my brother, and they're like, I wanted to, as isn't me, but anyway, they uh, wanted to, the next car to be an EV, but they wanted to wait another year. If, in my opinion, in if you want to go full, 
if you can wait one more year, like, and you, that Kia 700 kilometer range, right? That is crazy. So, and for, yeah, and that one will be open up. We'll have that, that plug in it. I was looking at a Ranger and Ford, but it was going to take over a year before it could get here. Is that still an issue? Yeah. 